So let's begin reading at verse 15. I'll read to verse 18. We'll get into our study. Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 15, reading to verse 18. Now we'll go into a prolonged introduction. I have to give to you layers of information in order for us to understand the context. And so I'll read these verses, and then I'm going to give you a long introduction. I'm going to ask you to listen to me as I'm sharing with you to lay those layers in order that you'll get a better um, a view of what is, what is being spoken of here in, in these verses. So beginning in Matthew 24, at verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. As we look at Matthew 24, let me remind you, and again, I'm going to lay some foundation for us so that we can move into a better understanding of what Jesus is speaking of here in Matthew 24. We know that in Matthew 24, Jesus is answering a question that has been posed by Peter, James, John, and Andrew. The question that they had asked is found in verse 3 of chapter 24 when they said, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So Jesus is answering this question and he begins to outline conditions that will exist prior to his return. He started with events that begin in what is called the church age. And he said, these are signs. There'll be an increasingly widespread spiritual deception. There will be wars on an international scale. There will be famines. There will be pestilence and uh, earthquakes. And this will all be on the increase. In verse 8, Jesus said, these are the beginning of sorrows. In other words, these things are the initial indicators that there is more to come soon. Now, Jesus initially outlined general conditions that would exist. When we got to verse 9, the word tribulation was introduced. He said, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And so the word tribulation needs to be considered for a moment because on the one hand, there is a tribulation that every believer encounters. When you look at the word tribulation in the original language, because we need to remember that the original New Testament a language was Koine Greek, common Greek. When you look at the word tribulation in the original language, it, it literally speaks of affliction. It speaks of anguish, distress, trouble, and persecution. That's how the word is generally used. And so, on the one hand, believers experience affliction as part of our normal Christian life. You see, to believers, Jesus was stating that they would be delivered up to tribulation and even be killed. But this tribulation speaks of the kind of tribulation that believers do encounter. You see, suffering for righteousness' sake is part of the cost of following Jesus Christ. In John 16, Jesus said at verse 33, he said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So, under general life conditions, afflictions are part of what believers will endure. We do endure tribulation. And as we do so, God works in us and he teaches us through it. Romans 5 verse 3 says, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And so we actually have our faith refined and strengthened, and it demonstrates the reality of it as we persevere through these various afflictions we go through. That's part of the normal Christian life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul said, God comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And so, as you go through the afflictions of following Christ, and there are many that you will endure, 
you have your faith purged, you are strengthened, and then you're able to encourage other people who go through the same. Somebody once said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So believers in the days preceding the return of Jesus will endure tribulation. Now, during the time specifically referred to as the tribulation, it becomes intense. There's, an, there's something that'll occur, I'll point it out again in just a moment, but it's called the rapture, and after the rapture, there'll be intense persecution against believers, and during this time, believers converted uh, during the tribulation will increasingly be persecuted. There will be false believers who will be exposed and will inform on genuine Christians. Deception will be increasing. Lawlessness will abound. But in spite of all of this, the gospel will continue to be faithfully preached through genuinely converted believers as well as other means that the Lord uses. After the rapture, there will be a seven-year period called the tribulation. So this time, spoken of as the tribulation, is also referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble as well as Daniel's 70th week. And it can be broken into two sections, tribulation and great tribulation. You'll see that in just a moment. And so what is this tribulation that is spoken of? Well, let me give to you some very basic things, some foundational information in order for us to understand what Jesus is speaking about when we get to verse 15. Here's some foundational information, five things about the tribulation. One, the tribulation in Scripture is the final judgment of God on a Christ-rejecting world. It's the final judgment of God on a Christ-rejecting world. You need to remember that the church is not judged along with a Christ-rejecting world because we didn't reject Him. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9, Paul said it like this. He said, much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. You see, in, in Revelation chapter 6, there are those who are crying out, saying, save us from the wrath of the Lamb. The tribulation is God's pouring out of His wrath on a Christ-rejecting world, but the church will not be part of it. It is also, secondly, a relatively brief period of time. It lasts seven years. You see that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, as well as Revelation 11, Revelation 12, as well as Revelation 13. It's relatively brief. Third, it is a period of unrestrained spiritual delusion and human wickedness. If we think it's bad now, it's going to get worse later. It says in verse 12 here in chapter 24, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. And so it'll be an unrestrained time of wickedness. A fourth thing is that it is a time of Israel's greatest suffering. You see that in verses 21 and 22 of this chapter. Then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. It'll be a time of great suffering. And finally, it occurs between the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, last week I mentioned the rapture. This is an event, again, that will occur prior to the tribulation. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. There are those who will say that there's no such thing as a rapture. They'll say you... Christians use the term rapture, and you can't even find it in the Bible. See, when you look at 1 Thessalonians 4, it speaks concerning being caught up. It doesn't say raptured, and thus they'll say, it doesn't say rapture, it says caught up, and thus you've made up or invented uh, something that isn't even found in Scripture. One, we need to know that the New Testament used the word harpazo. The word harpazo in the Greek speaks of seizing or taking something forcefully away. When the New Testament was translated into Latin, the Latin word was used to describe the Greek word harpazo, 
And the Latin word is where we get the word rapture from. And so the Bible speaks concerning an event called the rapture. There is nothing prophetically that needs to be fulfilled until that event takes place. I was with Pastor Chuck Smith before he went to heaven, and he and I were on, a, on the uh, To Every Man and Answer program that is broadcast on uh, K-Wave, and Pastor Chuck was normally on that answering biblical questions, and uh, on occasion he would ask others to come and join him, and on this one particular time I went with him and, and joined him, and uh, I, I had a great time. One of the questions that was asked uh, came in from a caller from Chino. I still remember that. I was seated across from Pastor Chuck, and, and they said, we have a caller from Chino, and this was years ago now, and, and so the voice comes over the phone and says, hi, Pastor Chuck, and um, I wanted to ask you a question, and as I was seated there, I thought, I recognize that voice. I'd like to ask you about tattoos, Pastor Chuck. Is it a sin to get a tattoo? And Chuck answers and says, no, it's not. He says, I don't know why you would, but no, it's not a sin. He said, thank you, Pastor. And I said, wait a minute, David. It was my son. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, it may not say you can't get a tattoo, but it does say honor thy father and thy mother, okay? <laughs> but we were answering questions together, and one of the questions that was asked was, what needs to be accomplished in terms of just the prophetic overview, uh, what is the next prophecy that, that will be fulfilled? And, and Chuck immediately pointed out that the next prophecy in the Bible that needs to be fulfilled will be the rapture. The rapture is, there's nothing that is to be fulfilled prior to that. That's the reason why we use the word imminence. We believe that that is something that is imminent. It's about to happen. It's just even at the door. The next thing that happens is the rapture of the church. We are not entering into the pouring out of the wrath on a Christ-rejecting world because we did not reject Jesus Christ. When Jesus was speaking in the book of Revelation in chapter 3, he gave a promise to the church of Philadelphia. He said, in Revelation 3, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. The church will be kept from the trial that comes on the whole world. We're going to be taken when Jesus removes the church, and then he begins to pour out his judgment on those who have rejected him. So, when we get to verse 15 here in chapter 24, he says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, now notice, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. And so, as the Lord is speaking here, he's pointing out that the church will be kept from the hour of trial, but he's giving now a key sign that's related to his second coming. Notice he said in verse 15 again, when you see the abomination of desolation. He's not speaking to these men, by the way. He's speaking to future believers because notice how it says in verse 15, whoever reads, let him understand. This is to future believers. Remember that he had been questioned already concerning when the temple and all would be destroyed? Because the temple was destroyed. And yet he's speaking as if the temple is in existence. Because it will be rebuilt in the yet future. And that's why those of us who are reading need to understand these things. And so he's speaking here concerning the abomination of desolation. Notice prophesied by Daniel standing in the holy place. Let me develop this with you a little bit further. Prior to the rapture. Prior to the rapture comes a progressive promotion of deception. This deception will permeate the world, and this deception promotes a rejection of the gospel. During the church age, believers are to continue to live the gospel and evangelize, but over time, 
the church will be infiltrated with false believers. Jesus in Matthew 13 referred to them as, as tares. So the purity of the church begins to be compromised with sin becoming acceptable. And that's already taken place in our day, by the way. Sin has become acceptable. I was with uh, several pastors recently back east, and uh, we were conversing concerning the condition of the church. One of them was mentioning to me, <clears throat> and I won't give any names because I don't think it's proper to do that at this point, but he was mentioning to me concerning some well-known television personalities and how it was a, it, there, was a, there was a cruise that was set up for Christian TV personalities and worship leaders. This just this happened recently, um, and they were sharing with me about the condition of the church, and they were saying that there was one particular person who went on that cruise who's a worship leader, well-known, and while he was there, several of, and if I gave you the names of these people, you, you'd know them. They had an open bar, and these TV personalities, younger guys, were busy drinking. And one of them got so drunk, he turned to this other fella and said to him, uh, man, I'm going to have a hangover tomorrow. How about you? And this other young man said, no, I won't have any hangover. I don't drink. And it was in the context of conversation of how certain things have infiltrated the church and become acceptable to the degree that even those who are well known for promoting on TV messages are very often not living out those messages and are living in a carnal way. And what we have today, and this can, kind of sounds, I know it's going to sound um, hateful and this and that, and that's okay. I'm used to that. I'm a very hateful guy. Um, but that's a bottom line kind of thing, is that the church, because it isn't being taught, because the church isn't being taught the word, and because people no longer endure healthy teaching, they don't want to put up with it. They want to hear things that tickle their ears because that is true. And Paul said it. I'll show you that in just a moment. What happens is we begin to judge the reality of whether or not God is present, not based on whether the people actually are being formed into the image of Christ, not, not based on whether the people who attend that church actually are sincere in their faith and are, and are maturing in the things of God, not based on the things that you see that are actually what we call the marks of the church in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, where they were constantly steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread and prayers, where God was moving, they were in fellowship. It was just a wonderful, wonderful thing. The church in the early days was, was, was being used by God in mighty ways, and, and the gospel was flowing from Judea, Samaria, uh, and, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, the church is, in the last day is getting caught up with the infiltration and what happens is through the delusion of false teachers, it ceases living in a holy fashion. And because it is ceasing to live in a holy fashion, it's actually not giving the message that will save people. And so what he's speaking about is that there'll be a deception that takes place and it promotes a rejection of the gospel that believers will be... Um, are supposed to continue to live the gospel and evangelize, but the purity of the church begins to be compromised with sin because it becomes acceptable. This is all coming through, according to verse 11, false teachers. False teachers who continue to arise and false teachers who continue leading people astray. And as mentioned, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. This promotion of deception is fueled by the influence or the spirit of the Antichrist. In 1 John 4, 3, it says, Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. This influence encourages the rejection of Jesus and results in the accepting of Antichrist. And this rejection is propagated by false prophets, and it leads to the worldwide acceptance of this figure that is referred to as the Antichrist. So after the rapture, false prophets continue to abound. They continue promoting Antichrist. At that time, the man of sin 
will be revealed. He is called the son of perdition. When you read your Bible, you see the Antichrist. We know him best by that term, but he's also re referred to as man of sin, also called son of perdition. He is the lawless one. He's referred to as the beast, the little horn, the wicked one, and also the willful king. And this one's going to be accepted because the world will be prepared for him by false prophets. When you look at your Bible, you discover that he begins in a non-threatening way. He develops a following. And it is at that time that he signs a covenant with Israel. The first few years, the first three and a half years or so of his quote-unquote rule, is, he'll be looked at as being a, a man of peace. He even is going to broker some kind of covenant with the nation of Israel. It says in Daniel 9, 27, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So that tells us that there will be a covenant that is signed that allows sacrifice and offering to take place. And yet, that temple is not rebuilt. It's not built yet. And so that tells us it's the, last, the day, last days that he's speaking about. And he says, and, the wing, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. That's what Jesus is speaking about. In verse 15, when he says, the abomination of desolation. I've mentioned to you that the covenant most likely will include the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. But in the middle of the week, in the middle of the tribulation, which is broken into tribulation and great tribulation, in the middle of the week, he breaks the covenant. He's going to demand worship in the temple. He's going to declare himself to be God. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, it says, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshiped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. To perpetuate that, he has an image that is made and his image is commanded to be worshiped. In Revelation 13 verses 14 and 15, it says, the false prophet deceives those who dwell on the earth by these signs, which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. This makes up the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel. Is it possible for something like that to happen today? Absolutely. Was it possible during the day of the writing of the gospel, that there could be an animated statue of some sort that speaks and people would actually do homage to? No. This is something that happens in the last days. And that's why we would get this addendum, whoever reads, let them understand. Somebody said, Jesus was not giving warnings to the disciples themselves or to their generation, but to believers in the end time who would read this and would need to be strengthened. That, when this happens, by the way, Israel is going to be taken by surprise and intense persecution will begin. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Antichrist declares himself God that precipitates the three and a half years of great tribulation. This occurs in his last three and a half years. What are you to do? Well, verse 16, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go down to take anything out of the house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to not be caught up with material things. They are in immediate danger. Antichrist has set up operational headquarters in Jerusalem, so those in Judea are to flee. You're to run for safety. You're to take flight in order to escape the danger. Not every Jew will be successful in escaping, but some will, and they will be converted. In Zechariah 13, 8 and 9, it says, In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. 
They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say they are my people. They will say the Lord is our God. We have seen Holocaust in, in the history of the United States. This will be intense persecution to the destruction of so many. Those who survive and trust in him will be his covenant people. Jeremiah 31, 33, and 34 says this, This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, and will be their God. They shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So God is going to provide a place for them to flee to. Notice with me in verse 16, it said, let, let, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When you look at Revelation chapter 12, especially right around verse 14, it speaks of God preparing a place for them to be safe. When you combine that with Isaiah 16, 1 through 4, it appears that God is going to open up a place in Jordan. And the place that he will open up is going to be in a city called Petra. And there will be those who flee into Jordan and are protected in Petra. In Isaiah 16, it says, verses 1 through 4, Send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah, which is Petra, to the wilderness, to the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be a wandering bird thrown out of the nest. So shall be the daughters of Moab, which is Jordan, at the fords of the Arnon. Take counsel, execute judgment. Make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day. Hide the outcast. Do not betray him who escapes. Let my outcast dwell with you, O Moab, O Jordan. Be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler. For the extortioner is at an end. Devastation ceases. The oppressors are consumed. As a lance away says, flee, and they will flee from Judea, and many of them more than likely will cross and go into Jordan. Notice how it says in verses 17 and 18, let him who's on the housetop not come down to take anything and not to return from the fields to pick up anything. Don't go and get, back, get your clothes. In other words, no material possession is worth the risk of being caught and killed. Don't go back for it. What do you have, in other words, that is worth losing your life over? What is it that you have? What will a man give in exchange for his soul, Jesus said. And he's saying, I'm warning you in advance. These things are going to take place. The persecution is going to be intense. There will be people who are slaughtered. You're going to be fleeing. You need to get out. You need to get away. Don't even come down from your patio that's over your roof where you, where you sit during the summer and it's cool, much cooler than being in the house. Get out. If you're in a field and you hear these things are taking place, don't return to pick up something. Just leave. What do you have that matters to you more than your life? And that's the whole thing. He's basically saying, don't cling to the things that can't save you. This is another thing that we, by way of application today, should, should remember. And, 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 and yet we, we don't sometimes. We, we don't remember that, that the things we have, though they're, they're nice to have, but they also perish with the using. And we fail to remember that. Sometimes we really do think that if we get that cabin, or if we get that car, or if we get that pool, if we get that whatever, it's going to make us happy. And yes, of course, there's certain satisfaction, and there's nothing wrong with having that cabin. There's nothing wrong with having the nice car or the pool. Of course not. But when that becomes my life goal, and I think that by having these things, I'm going to be satisfied, then it just takes a little while for you to be able to obtain a goal and to realize that it really, it doesn't satisfy all it does is whet your appetite for something else. That's all it does. You save your nickels and your dimes, and you buy that car that you wanted so badly. It's got to be this car. It's got to be this model. It's got to have these things. You finally save for a few years. You finally get the model, and then the new model comes out the next model year. And you go, oh, man, if I'd have waited one year, I'd be able to have, instead of 400 horsepower, I'd have 450 horsepower. Oh, and it's only, and that's what we do. That's what we do, and I've said this more than once. You know, the uh, junkyards and trash places are, are filled with our treasures, the things that we really needed to have. And once we got them, we had them for a while, we put them in the trash, and now they're somebody else's treasure. That's what we do. And that's so basic. That's so commonsensical. 
And yet the church has to be reminded of that. Somebody said the possessive clinging to things must be torn from our souls in violence. Even like when Jesus expelled the money changers from the temple. It has to be expelled from our souls because it is so entrenched. So, God is heard of the evil that has taken place in Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. And he's come to see what is taking place. And there's a man who has come to sojourn in Sodom, who has actually become a person who sits at the gate. He has a family. His soul, Peter tells us, was a righteous soul that was vexed constantly by the sinfulness of the city that he lived in. Angels come and speak to him and say, you need to get out and you need to get out now because God's bringing judgment. He's got a family, wife, children, some daughters who are married. He begins to speak to them and say, we got to get out of here because evil is coming and God's judgment is going to deal with this. We need to go. And two of his daughters who are married say, <laughs> no, there's no way we're going to stick behind. But he's got two unmarried daughters and he's got a wife. She's not even mentioned. She's just Mrs. Lot. And she leaves with him. But the Bible very distinctly says that as they had left the precincts, they had been told not to look back, but to get out because judgment was going to fall. And the Bible speaks how Lot's wife turned to look and was caught in the judgment. When I first read that as a young believer, I thought, just turning and looking? But when you begin to study the passage and you look into the commentators in the original language, you discover something. It wasn't that she glanced over her shoulder just to make sure nobody's following is that she planted herself in such a way as to long to return to the place she had just been delivered from. In other words, her body wasn't in the city, but her heart remained there. And because her heart remained in that place, she was caught in the judgment of that place. Just because somebody comes to a church doesn't mean their heart isn't still in Sodom. That's the point. And that's why Jesus said in Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. Remember her. Remember Lot's wife. And then he said, whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. Remember Lot's wife. Become detached from this age. Don't leave your roof to go and get something. Don't leave your field to come and retrieve something. When you hear these things are taking place, flee, because it's coming. And that's what the Lord is saying here. Notice how he says in verse 19, Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. It's going to be difficult for them. That's why he says, woe unto them. It's going to be difficult. You mamas and pregnant women will not be able to move quickly. Pray that it's not on the Sabbath, he goes on. Why? Or winter. Why? Because winter brings severe conditions, and, and on the Sabbath, it tells us that the Sabbath is enacted because legalistic Jews will impede their flight. And then he says in verse 21, then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no nor ever shall be. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. There will be great tribulation. In Daniel 12, verse 1, there will be a time of distress such as, not, as, as has not happened from the beginning of nations until now. Great tribulation. Great tribulation. The escalating judgments on man. The, the judgments demonstrating the wrath of God. They're enumerated for you if you'd like to read about it on your own in Revelation chapter 6 through 19. And yet he says, the elect's sake, this speaks of redeemed Israel as well as Gentile converts. Unless those days were shortened, the earth would be annihilated. Now he goes and finally 
Verse 23, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. If someone says, verse 23, look, here's the Christ. People have fled to the mountains. They're going to hear rumors that Jesus returned. False prophets will be performing miracles in an attempt to draw people out. Again, there are many today who look to miracles as evidence that God exists. And indeed, God per performs miracles. There's no doubt about that. But the world is already being set up to receive the false prophets and the Antichrist because the miracle is looking for some kind of proof that there is a God. And in many people's minds, the supernatural is always an evidence of the reality of God. And sometimes you will have people who believe in things that are not in the Bible, but they say, well, I have to believe it because I've seen it or I've experienced it myself. When in fact, because they're not taking scripture and, and using scripture as, as the proof text for whether or not you can believe those things, they just believe based on their emotion. It's interesting how that when the day of Pentecost had fully arrived, you see it in the book of Acts, on the, on the day of Pentecost that had fully arrived and the people had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the 120 who were there in an upper room, according to Acts chapter 2, spilled out of that upper room, and they were speaking in, in supernatural languages, languages that had been given to them by, by the gifting of the Spirit himself. They were unlearned languages, but they were speaking in the tongues of so many people who were there, and asked, they he went so far as to ask the question, how, have, how can they speak this way, having never learned our language? And when this is all happening, there's a mocking that takes place. Oh, they're just filled with new wine. In other words, they're drunk. When the apostle Peter stands up to speak in that great Pentecost sermon, he begins by saying, these men are not drunk as you suppose. It's too early in the morning. The bars aren't even open. And then he does this. He gives a scriptural explanation. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, who said, any supernatural manifestation must have a scriptural explanation. And unfortunately, because people today don't know scripture, they fall for the deception. And they're going to be saying, oh, Christ is here. But Jesus is saying, no, you're in hiding. They're going to try and lure you out because you desire to be released from all that's going on and to see me. Do not do it. You see, under the pressure of the time, they want to be with him. False signs and wonders will occur in order to catch genuine believers. It's Satan's last effort to destroy them. In 2 Corinthians 11:13, Paul said, Such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. In verse 26, he simply says, do not believe it. Why? Well, verse 27, he says, For as the lightning comes from the east, flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be sudden, and it's going to be obvious. It is going to be sudden, and it is going to be visible. It isn't going to come through people saying, Oh, Christ is here. It's going to be something everybody sees. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, it says this, Look, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Every eye will see him. We will see him. And he's saying when he comes, it's going to be obvious. It's not going to be that he's in a desert. It's not going to be that he's in the inner room. It's going to be something you'll see. It. It's sudden and it's obvious. Keep that in mind because I've mentioned this to you before, but it bears repetition. The Jehovah's Witness, an organization that goes door to door and talks about the last days and this and that. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that in 1914, Jesus received his crown and began to reign invisibly. 
One of their periodicals says this. I'm quoting their periodical. Although it occurred invisibly to our human eyes in the heavens, yet it was in the year 1914 that there were given to the Son of Man all that rulership, dignity, and kingdom. They believed that Jesus received his crown and began to reign invisibly in 1914. Jesus said, no. Jesus said, it's going to be sudden and it's going to be obvious and all people will see. I'm not doing this invisibly. I'm not doing this in hiding. It will be done openly. And he finally says in verse 28, wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Remember that an eagle is really a vulture. It's carrion. They feast on the dead. He's saying that the world will be reduced to a lifeless corpse, lying unburied, surrounded. By the end of the Great Tribulation, the world will have been terribly judged. It'll be like a lifeless carcass in a wilderness, and ultimately Jesus will be its judge. That's why Hebrews 10.31 speaks in this way, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He has said to us, I tell you these things in advance. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again unto you and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The next prophecy to be fulfilled is Jesus taking the church to be with him. These things are not things that you have to go through. I've been asked, do you think that this is soon? And I have to say what Jesus said, his coming is even at the door. Is it soon? Yes. Well, didn't you believe that when you first got saved back in 1970? Yes. Well, it's been a long time. Yeah, that simply means his coming is sooner. It just means it's even closer. Are you ready is the question. Are you ready? Listen, you may look at this as being just kind of uh, just something in some old book. But it's absolutely true. We are seeing days that are evil. We are seeing things today, aren't we, that were not even mentioned in polite society 50 years ago, 60 years ago. There are things on TV, you just regular TV, that you turn on and you see today unfiltered, uncensored, that you would, you would never have seen even in your parents' generation, in my generation. I mean, we come from a time, some of us come from a time when, when not that many people even had TVs. I come from a time when we actually went to my aunt's house to watch color TV. We didn't have color TV. And she had a huge TV, it was 19 inches. <laughs> Amazing. And we saw the Beatles on it. We come from a time when Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz on the I Love Lucy show, they didn't even sleep in the same bed. And yet somehow they had little Ricky. We never figured that one out. <laughs> it was just that way, wasn't it? I mean, that's the way it was. You didn't have toilets flush until Archie Bunker flushed the toilet in All in the Family, and that was looked at as revolutionary TV. So the things that some of you who are younger have grown up with, has calloused your soul. You're callous to things. You're used to seeing things like Janice Jackson popping out of her top on the Super Bowl and things of that nature. Where people, they used to go and they would, they actually, police actually arrested Jim Morrison from the doors for lewd behavior on a stage. You used to go to college to learn things that would help you in life. We live in a different time. You didn't parade for perversions. You didn't give people permission to believe that if you want to be a male, even though you're a female, it's what you feel you are. We have come into crazy days, crazy days that are looked at as being normal. And when people like me stand up and say, you realize, of course, that we should pity those who are so deceived. My heart goes out to them because they're so messed up. But 
that view has always been re recognized as kind of kind of crazy way to think. It's an improper way to think because it's not real. I mean, I could stand up here right now and tell you that I'm a six foot eight a black uh, NBA player, and if I want to believe that, who are you to tell me I'm wrong? That's what I believe. It's your, you're going to believe your eyes, or are you going to believe me? And that's, that's what we're living in, right? Am I wrong? Am I wrong? It's crazy. But we have, come, we have come to a place where we accept anything, anything that comes down the pike. We believe it. I don't because I have a book that is inspired by God who teaches me truth and helps us separate the darkness from the light. We have not been deceived. We believe God's word. God never lies, he tells the truth. Because, because of that, when we speak the truth, we are haters. Remember with me that in the early days of the church, we were called haters of mankind. And the reason we were referred to as haters of mankind, it was a charge against the church. Part of the reason is because we actually spoke what the Bible said concerning life. And oh, we were so opposed to what was being said by the common intelligentsia of the day. Well, guess what? That's happening to this day. So anybody who stands up and says the kinds of things that a, a, a man like myself and, and like, like some of you in this room, when you stand up and say, no, I don't believe that, I believe this. Are you gonna believe that stupid old book? You really believe that? And the answer to that is, well, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Listen, if you don't believe in, in, in God who can preser preserve his word, my God doesn't lie, and my God is able to preserve his word. It's the most important thing in the universe, the word of God. It's a message whereby a man must cling to in order to be saved. Are you saying that if there is a God, he's not capable of giving us his word? He is capable of giving us his word. Not only that, he is capable of transforming lives by his word and by his power, and that's why we're prepared, and that's why we will not accept the Antichrist, we will receive Jesus Christ. Because, listen, my children and my grandchildren, now my grandchildren, they will receive either Jesus Christ or Antichrist. I'm raising them to receive Jesus Christ, the true Christ who will set them free. That comes from this book. That's how it works.